This is Twit. We talked a little bit about Charter. Now, they're ranked as the second largest cable operator after Comcast. They report over 27 million residential and business customers from coast to coast. But its problems began in New York when it acquired Time Warner Cable back in 2015 for $57 billion. Now, Charter Communications purchased Time Warner Cable, but they potentially are one of the, this is one of the most disruptive purchases in the history of telecom under fire. Now, it's under fire because in the past several weeks, the New York State Public Service Commission voted to revoke, revoke its approval of the sale. Now, the reason for the revoke, they have a laundry list of stuff here. I'll try to go through some of them. Now, the company's repeated failures to meet deadlines, Charter's attempts to skirt obligations to serve a rural communities, unsafe practices in the field, its failure to fully commit to its obligations under the 2016 merger agreement, and the company's purposeful obfuscation of its performance and compliance obligations to the commission and its customers. Now, and Charter insists that it's hit, it actually hit its deadlines and it remains in compliance. But if the threat of making Spectrum forfeit its cable franchise wasn't enough, Charter Spectrum is also facing secondary serious allegations by the state attorney general themselves. Now, Chibert, is, is this going to be enough to move such a large company and actually send a message so that they can start doing the right thing here. Because a lot of these deals, they just say, oh, yeah, we'll do that. As long as you approve this thing, we'll do it. And then they go and do it, and then nothing happens thereafter. So this is the way New York State is handling it. They're saying, you know what? You're violating all these things, so we just don't approve it anymore. You you, you can go do your thing, but you're not going to be able to do be the same entity. Um, and the only way to do it is to start go doing these things. Is this a way to send a message? Does every state have to do this? I don't know. I hope not. But it the the bottom line is New York State Attorney General. Well, their um, oh god, what do they call them? I in Hawaii we call it the Public Utilities Commission, but they got to do something. And sadly, it looks like they're using this case as an example and i gotta imagine you know all the things i've been reading lots and lots and lots of states are looking at what new york is doing and saying maybe this will work so there's a lot of wait and see um the fact that these companies are not fulfilling the terms of their contract you know if you're a smaller company you didn't you know comply to the terms of your contract in New York State, you'd get shut down in a heartbeat. But if you're a multi-billion dollar corporation, you get slapped on the wrist. You know, I think it's time to level the playing field and to um, the folks in New York State, good luck. <laughs> I agree. I think it, 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 this is, gives it the option to, at least it's, it gives more options to consumers because you're kind of pushing the enterprise, these large telecoms to do the right thing especially if they're violating some of the rules that they agreed to do. Bam, I want to throw this over to you because I think, you know, you, you deal with a lot of networking, a lot of companies, a lot of telecoms out there. You know, good quality networking is hard to find. So especially in, the, especially in rural areas, you know, yeah. Charter promised to do it, right? They promised to make this better. And then as long as they promise to do that, they could get their merger approved. Do you think that this is fair that they're being, um, you know, targeted and, and, and being held accountable? I'm not one to uh, be in favor of a lot of regulation, but I got to say that the, the cable companies in particular have been playing with house money for a long time. Um, I dealt with this in my, my past life, you know, running IT uh, for for various uh, small, medium sized companies and uh, often to get good service. I'd have to you know go and get waivers and. Uh, have you know one cable company come in and get waivers to pull cable in like you know a few hundred yards across some imaginary boundary where they didn't have um, rights to come in and it's it's a it's a real nightmare for somebody that's on the enterprise side for somebody that's a, a regular consumer they have no options right they have whatever's there they're not they're not getting any waivers signed they're not um, doing anything like that so there's really this this true monopoly system. Uh, Verizon Fios, you know, because they're not technically a cable company, has kind of uh, come in and disrupted that. And, you know, other fiber to the home services, you know, Google's service uh, have kind of come in and, and provided like real broadband 
competition. But where I live, I don't have a choice, right? So in my home, I have, uh, you know, I'm using Comcast cable because the only other option, uh, aside from satellite-based uh, internet access, is uh, DSL, which maxes out at one meg download speeds, which clearly are not going to keep up with uh, the demands of, of my type of work and also everything that me and my wife and my children all stream all the time and download and so on and so on. So, you know, right now I'm, I'm paying the only game in town. And when things like this, and, and this is really not too distant from a, a really hot button topic like net neutrality, uh, we start to look at, you know, we really do have to hold these companies to their commitments uh, so that they deliver things. And, and it goes back to even the previous bite, right? We talked about, you know, electronic voter IDs. And now we're talking about, hey, there's people in rural areas that, that are not getting the Internet access they should. So this is, you know, proof point one that um, good, solid Internet access is something that's become a fundamental uh, I won't. I won't say right, but you, having the option for it should be something that is provided for, just like you know other utilities. Right. I, I kind of glad you brought that up because I think net neutrality is a good example of this because you know a lot of people have more than one option in their area. They pay per, for premium service. They pay for the hundred megabit. They pay for the gigabyte services, but they don't get the quality service. They get. They might. They don't get consistent speeds. Things drop down, and when they call in, you know these companies say, "Hey, well, these are just met." For things to load faster, it's not that we meant for large downloads of data. We just want things to go a little faster for you. And I think that that's just kind of the consensus of what's going on with net neutrality is, hey, not only will you pay for premium service, but you maybe even later on pay for you know faster lanes to Netflix or faster lanes to this or faster lanes to that. And it, it's just ways for telecoms to create harder problems for consumers and more expensive problems. And so only the people who have the money who can do it will get the premium and sometimes not even guaranteed to get the premium. So cheaper, I want to throw this over to you because, you know, do you think that keeping these two companies separate, it forces them to be competitors and it forces them for a little bit more competition in the market, which is sometimes better for consumers. And then this way, you know, maybe one company uh, in the market or these, maybe the smaller telecoms can say, start doing the right thing and not being charged customers for these things. And then at least the bigger telecoms will get the message. Is this just a, more of a net neutrality thing? Is it a competitive thing? What do you, where do you think is the benefit of keeping them separate? I think one of the things that's going to happen or starting to happen that's going to be really, really interesting is the FTC seems to be starting to feel their oats. And, uh, you know, some of the blips and bites that we've done in the, in the last half a year or so uh, if you read between the lines, <clears throat> it almost feels like the FTC is going to start implementing something along the lines of GDPR. Now, the reason why I bring this up is there's a um, interesting trend that's starting to happen. I'm actually knee deep in one of them, well, hip deep, with the advent of 5G. I was talking to um, some of the folks in the chat room about that. 5G right out out of the gate is going to be more for distribution than it is to the endpoints. Um, but having the 5G to go out and get things out into the world is going to be really interesting, especially for the wireless internet service provider, a WISP. I'm actually in the process of working with some friends here in Honolulu on designing the backend network uh, for a WISP. And with the new millimeter, you know, the, especially the 60 gigahertz stuff, we have the bandwidth so that I, in theory, can provide gigabit symmetrical to the home for the cost that you could get, say, a charter um, cable modem. So I'm hoping what happens is that the states feel that maybe there is another way. They don't have to go through the morass of pole attaches or at least less pole attach issues and then maybe just maybe the equivalent of the public utilities commissions in different states are going to say hey you guys aren't playing to the tune of this contract you don't have a monopoly anymore we're going to open it up and you guys must provide them you know the horizontal so that's going to be really interesting and I gotta imagine this coming year, 
the blips and the bites are going to have an awful lot on this topic. <laughs> I agree as well. Now, I've, I've had business internet for a while because of, there's SLA on the service uptime. There's quality of service requirements. Now, I pay more for less speeds, but I don't have any TV or I don't have any phone service. Uh, I just have this really high quality uh, a business service. And the reason why I do that is because I go in and start paying for services like YouTube TV or Direct TV now. And I think, Brian, you brought this, bam, you actually brought this up a little bit, is, you know, especially with this type of merger and with the net neutrality rules going down the toilet, it makes it easier for companies like this, right, to start regulating and blocking services like this. So now cord, it makes it hard for cord cutters, right? Absolutely. Yeah, we're, we're a cord cutter family. And, uh, you know, we, we've just found that after a while, all we do is stream stuff anyway. So why continue to pay for television service from the cable company? And so we, we went through the process, but I just imagine a day when, you know, you know, my cable provider says, hey, we don't want you getting local channels from DirecTV now. Why not, you know, we, we can just squash, you know, make that that stream uh, perform poorly. It's very easy for them to identify which uh, byte stream it is so they can squash that without damaging the rest of the service they provide me over the internet and, and force me back to them for, you know, local TV service, which uh, seems very, you know, sort of anti-free market, if you ask me. And the free market economy and capitalism, that's, isn't that what, you know, part of, uh, you know, our values as Americans? Right, right, right. Well, I agree with Chibert. I think this is this is topic is not going to go away. And I'm sure we're going to hear more and more about it um, as the years go on, as even as legislation changes for it.